The shopping cart is the ultimate litmus test for whether a person is capable of self-governing. To return the shopping cart is an easy, convenient task, and one which we all recognise as the correct, appropriate thing to do. To return the shopping cart is objectively right. There are no situations other than dire emergencies in which a person is not able to return their cart. Simultaneously, it is not illegal to abandon your shopping cart. Therefore, the shopping cart presents itself as the apex example of whether a person will do what is right without being forced to do it. No one will punish you for not returning the shopping cart. No one will fine you or kill you for not returning the shopping cart. You gain nothing by returning the shopping cart. You must return the shopping cart out of the goodness of your own heart. You must return the shopping cart because it is the right thing to do. Because it is correct. A person who is unable to do this is no better than an animal. An absolute savage who can only be made to do what is right by threatening them with the law and the force that stands behind them. The shopping cart is what determines whether a person is a good or bad member of society. Okay. That 4chan post from May 2020 titled Shopping Cart Theory quickly spread across the internet, with consensus emerging among many that this minor pet peeve is in fact an indication of a fundamental moral failing. The post was so prolific that it made it to the New York Times in an article titled Everyone Has a Theory about shopping carts. Three months earlier, February 2020, marked the launch of the YouTube channel Cartnarks. Cartnarks here, hello? You left your cart out! You left your cart out like a big old lazy bone! No one will punish you for not putting back your shopping cart? Oh no, the Cartnarks will punish you with shame. The premise of Cartnarks is simple. The Cartnarks are a team of well-trained agents singularly dedicated to making sure people return their shopping carts to the cart corral, the little station next to the parking lot where the carts go. They're headed by Agent Sebastian. Hey, I'm sorry, that's not where the cart goes. But they have members in various locations. There's Agent Cordell in Texas. Sir, that's not where the cart goes. Agent Cameron in Florida. That's not where the carts go. Agent McGraw in Georgia. Oh no. In case you haven't picked up on this, those are in fact all Agent Sebastian doing different voices. My name's in the Agent Vinnie Carterini. He goes around in his bulletproof vest, LARPing as a shopping cart cop. He has this whole routine where he goes up to the cart offender's car making obnoxious siren noises, bugs them about not putting their carts back, calls them lazy bones. My name's Agent Sebastian. I'm a highly trained special agent with the cart narcs. What we do is we narc people out who leave their carts out like this, like big old lazy bones. If they try to drive off, he puts a magnet on their car saying something like lazy bones on board or I don't return my shopping cart like a jerk. A few times he put a cart behind someone's car to stop them from backing out or he'll chase them around the parking lot a bit. One time he followed these people away from the store to like a storage unit and refuse to leave them alone? Can I have a, at least have a hug? No. Maybe a kiss? People get pissed off at him and yell at him and threaten to murder him. I'm a killer. Well, sir, that's not nice. I'm fixing to put about six right in your forehead. Sir, that's against the law. And of course, he's filming the whole thing with a GoPro and uploads the encounters to YouTube to publicly shame and ridicule the cart offenders. He's narking on them to the viewing public. Now, with almost 250,000 subscribers who, judging from the comments, see him as a righteous hero. <laughs> But not everyone is supportive of Sebastian's noble mission. He went on Dr. Phil a few months ago, where Phil scolded him for public shaming. You don't know what people's day is. You don't know what their life is. The evidence says that you can inspire change, but you can't shame change. Which is admittedly a little weird, coming from professional public shamer Dr. Phil as he publicly shames Sebastian. I am also going to be critical of Cartnarks in this video, though. And reading the comments on the Dr. Phil clips, I already know what some people are gonna think. The comments are filled with Cartnarks fans, many of them saying the same thing. Phil totally leaves his cart in the parking lot. Apparently there are exactly two sides here. The cart returning citizens full of praise for our brave Cartnark, and the lazy bones, terrified to be held accountable for their sins. So I want to be clear before I continue that I usually walk to the grocery store, so I don't get that much in one trip, so I just use a basket. But if I did use a shopping cart, I would return it. I promise.
Welcome to Cart Talk, your number one destination for all things cart. These wires are not plugged into anything. Cart Narcs originated as a segment on The Woody Show, a talk radio show that bills itself as insensitivity training for a politically correct world. Very brave very edgy. That might seem like an odd place for the channel to have started. Like, Agent Sebastian is pretty sensitive about shopping carts, right? He's all triggered in the parking lot as he virtue signals to the woke cart mob. But when shopping cart theory was making the rounds, some people in the anti-SJW internet were actually particularly passionate about it. Like, conservative commentator Steven Crowder shared this TikTok on his Facebook page. Tell me you're a Republican without telling me you're a Republican. What does this even mean? Is this the culture war now? The radical communist democrats refuse to return their shopping carts, owning the libs by returning your cart. According to the Cartnarks channel description, the intention of the videos is to promote personal responsibility, which is also why returning your cart is apparently a demonstration of conservative values. Conservative discourse emphasizes individual responsibility and personal character above all else. Stop complaining don't act like a victim, don't be a lazy bones, take some responsibility and bring back your own cart. What, do you want the government to put your cart back for you? There is an epidemic of lazy bones in America and the cart narcs are here to slide it back. Of course, this emphasis on responsibility isn't really exclusive to conservatives. In perusing shopping cart theory discourse, you can also find plenty of people comparing not returning your cart to conservatives not wearing masks in public. The big the basic idea of personal responsibility is a pretty ubiquitous cultural value. And that's the stated motivation driving Agent Sebastian. He's trying to encourage a sense of responsibility. But his efforts at fostering responsibility often just make things worse. He gives a variety of reasons for why it's bad to leave your cart out, but his own actions frequently directly worsen the problems he identifies. Like he says that not returning your cart makes employees' jobs harder because they have to round up stray carts. That's true, but it makes their jobs even harder if they have to de-escalate fights between assholes in the parking lot. This is a private property. Oh no, so I totally understand, yeah. totally understand. Yeah. I you was know, just- This is, I don't want this to get escalated. Oh, yeah. oh me this. neither, me yeah. neither. When somebody says they don't want to deal with you, don't want to talk to you, you have enough respect to turn your ass around. What if they're doing? He says that shopping carts inconvenience drivers when they block parking spots. Drivers are even more inconvenienced when you create a multi car backup riling someone up at the parking lot exit. <laughs> Thank you, please, knock at her. Sebastian also says that the shopping cart problem is particularly consequential for disabled people because carts are sometimes left in handicapped parking spots. But one reason that people sometimes don't return their carts is because of disabilities that reduce their mobility or make the extra walk across the parking lot painful or tiring. And Sebastian has no sympathy for this. When he sees someone in a handicapped parking spot, his immediate assumption is that they don't actually have have a disability. A person in a handicapped spot, which, by the way, clearly she doesn't need. And if the person tells him otherwise, he mocks them. I do have a handicap, actually. Uh, well, so just let you know, but I get what you're saying. Is it lazy bones itis? But like the heart, the head. I'm sorry, wait, what? Is your disability lazy, lazy bones itis? Dude, what the fuck? Disability is often invisible. You can't tell just by looking if someone is disabled. Being able to walk around a grocery store doesn't mean you're not exhausted or in pain. But for Sebastian, responsibility supersedes all else. Any reasons that returning a cart may be more difficult for some people than others are reduced to laziness. When Sebastian first approached this woman, she was initially willing to to just return the cart? No, no, I'll move it. Until he started ridiculing her disability status. She literally shows him her handicapped parking permit and he still doesn't relent. I'm sure you'd con some doctor into giving that to you. That's fantastic. You're not inside my body, so don't ever insult nobody. I doubt many By people are getting them. inside your body anytime soon. What an asshole. Sebastian is often needlessly cruel. He provokes his targets, even in videos like that one, in which it actually stops her from putting back the cart. He isn't sincerely looking out for 
retail workers or drivers in the parking lot or disabled people. He's willing to make all of their lives harder in order to put the lazy bones in their place. Cartnarks is basically a prank show. The entertainment is derived from creating uncomfortable situations in public. Sebastian's mom even appears in his Dr. Phil segment and compares Cartnarks to the OG prank show Candid Camera. I grew up in the 50s and 60s when the show Candid Camera was highly popular and that show would set up pranks that normally embarrassed people. I'm not above that, okay? I enjoy prank shows. I'm a bad person. I take pleasure in other people's suffering. But what's different about Cartnarks is that it's a prank show that wants you to believe it's a morally virtuous endeavor. In most prank shows, the prankster is knowingly committing a social violation. In Cartnarks, the victim has committed the violation, and the prankster is a holier-than-thou hero who can do no wrong. You're a bones and you think you're better than everybody you can't take you your card back you're better than everybody. that's Why right you? because i am outside of being a cart narc sebastian is also just a narc in general not like a literal federal narcotics agent but a snitch on the woody show and in interviews he repeatedly talks about how often he calls the cops i will call either 911 or not or the non-emergency number pretty like once a month once a month are you just like lonely? Here's one example of someone he called the police on. So there's this guy who sits outside this shopping center with like a grocery store and the gym I go to. He sits there in a wheelchair, he can walk. Uh, his gross feet are out, Ravy, which I know you don't support. Almost always has an open bottle of vodka with him and some mm -hmm. smokes and then, you know, homeless, please help. And I called the cops, the cops called me back. Eventually, like their public information officer saying, well, you know, we've gotten complaints, but people keep giving him money and keep giving him food. What? Yeah. Dude, you gotta well, arrest do him. Arrest him for what? Panhandling, which is against the law. Walking the sidewalk, which is against the law. Drinking in public, which is definitely against the law. Does this offend you, Sebastian? Are you offended right now? The guy was just sitting there holding a sign. He clearly was not doing any harm. But Sebastian doesn't care about harm. He only cares about perceived moral character. And to him, minor rule violations indicate faulty character. The actual material factors that contribute to homelessness, like unemployment, poverty, or lack of affordable housing, are all reduced to personal responsibility. Sebastian's policing of shopping carts works in the same way. Cartnarks isn't actually about addressing the harm that carts cause, it's about the character of those who fail to return them. The central concern of cart narcs isn't the carts, it's the lazy bones. But let's talk about the carts, okay? <laughs> That's right, we're talking about the history of the shopping cart. I can just feel my audience retention plummeting right now. I'll be drawing extensively on the research of Professor of Shopping Carts Andrew Warns in his book, How the Shopping Cart Explains Global Consumerism, which I definitely think is one of the best books about shopping carts of 2019. I can't believe I got a bunch of new subscribers and now this is the video I'm making. The shopping cart is a fitting symbol of personal responsibility because it's part of a larger history of grocery stores placing increasing responsibility on consumers. In the early 1900s, grocery stores operated very differently than they do today. You didn't go looking for your groceries yourself. Instead, you brought a list of items you wanted to a clerk at the front counter, and the clerk retrieved those items and brought them to you. You lazy bones. There is an epidemic of lazy bones in America. But in 1916, entrepreneur Clarence Saunders launched the first Piggly Wiggly's grocery store, a self-service store at which customers walked through the aisles themselves, picked out their own groceries, and put them in shopping baskets. There were no carts yet. The idea took off. For grocery store owners, one of the main reasons to adopt the self-service model was that they could make more money because they wouldn't have to pay as many clerks. The work that was once done by clerks would now be done by customers, and many grocery store employees lost their jobs as a result. For customers, self-service stores allow for more autonomy and choice. You get to pick out your own products. That also means that you're made responsible for the results. You can't blame the store if they give you some shitty fruit. You you picked that fruit out yourself. You no longer have a social relationship with a clerk selling you things. Now, the salesmanship is hidden and you interact directly with the products. You buy Cookie Crisp, 
because you're so mesmerized by Chip the Wolf's seductive smile. Around this time, cars were becoming more common in the US, which meant that people were able to buy more groceries in one trip. But you still couldn't buy that much because you just had a little basket. So in 1937, Sylvan Goldman, owner of the Humpty Dumpty supermarket chain, I don't know why all the grocery stores back then had like nursery rhyme names. Anyway, he set about trying to fix this. At one branch, he had employees monitor shoppers, and if your basket looked nearly full, they'd give you a new basket and bring your old one up to the checkout for you. But that meant he had to pay those employees, and no one wants to do that, so he was looking for another option. He put a shopping basket on a folding chair on some wheels and was like, this is great. People did not like the shopping cart. Women didn't want to use shopping carts because it reminded them too much of pushing baby strollers, while men thought that pushing a shopping cart would make them look weak. They're strong enough to handle a goddamn basket, okay? That was back when we had real men, unlike our feminized men today with their soy lattes and shopping carts. Little known fact, the aluminum in shopping carts actually injects estrogen right into your puny girl fingers. So Sylvan hired people to go into his stores and use shopping carts in the hopes that it would encourage other shoppers to do the same. And it worked. Shopping carts today, as you know, are all the rage. In the early days of the shopping cart, storage was more complicated, so you usually weren't allowed to take your cart out of the store, which meant that often employees would help you carry your groceries out to your car. But in 1946, inventor Orla Watson made a groundbreaking innovation in shopping cart technology. This swinging gate thing. That allowed carts to be nested together, eventually leading to the system we have today in which customers are asked to return their own carts to the cart corral. Again, eliminating a need for employee labor. There were cart pushers hired to retrieve carts from the parking lot, and there are still some today, as cart narcs targets like to point out. They pay people. Well, now, ma'am, do you, when you go to the. Sure. Do you pee on the seat when you use a public restroom because they pay people to clean it? But the number of people hired for that has decreased, and when employees go get your cart from the parking lot, that's generally not their main job. You are supposed to do it. As the signs in some grocery store parking lots say, the store is not responsible for damage caused by unattended carts. That responsibility is on you the customer. This shift towards self-service has since progressed further. Today, we have self-checkout machines where you scan and bag your own groceries. When you go to the grocery store, you don't have to interact with anybody. You get a shopping cart at the entrance. You put your groceries in it. You check yourself out. You bring your groceries to your car, and you return your cart to the cart corral. Or not. In this thoroughly desocialized grocery store where no contact with employees is necessary, I don't think it's that surprising that some customers would lack the social consideration to bring back their carts. And the thing is, the work that was once done by employees is still being done. It's just that now, some of it is being done by you for free. Increasingly at the grocery store, you are what scholars have called a prosumer, a consumer who is also engaged in productive labor. For example, you're a consumer of this video right now, but you're also producing a comment below telling me what cereal mascot you think is the hottest. There's always some work involved in being a consumer. At early grocery stores, you still had to make your own shopping list and talk to the clerk. But sociologists like George Ritzer argue that prosumption is increasingly a site of exploitation. You're not paid for the work you've taken on in the grocery store. The savings may to some extent be passed on to you with lower grocery prices, but not to the full extent of the money you're saving stores by replacing employees. This is most clear in stores that have both cashiers and self-checkout. You don't get a discount if you use the self-checkout aisle, but you're doing work that a cashier would otherwise be paid for. More generally, there just wouldn't be motivation for stores to make these self-service innovations if they weren't going to increase profit. They're expensive and inconvenient to implement, and the reason it's worth it is that the stores don't have to pay you in the way they would pay a worker. It's hard work going to the grocery store. 
right? You have to push your shopping cart around. You have to navigate your shopping cart between other shopping carts. You have to learn the layout of the store and figure out what sections you have to go to for the things you want. And maybe you have to reach around someone who's standing in front of the thing you want. You have to squeeze the fruits and sniff the fruits and Google how to tell if the fruits are ripe. You have to choose between like 50 different cereals. You have to scan the barcode on your bag of spinach, but it's a tiny barcode and the barcode reader isn't reading it. You have to accidentally put all your reusable bags on the self-checkout weight sensor, but then the machine tells you there's too much weight, so you have to take your reusable bags off of the self-checkout weight sensor, and you've already been working all day, and you're tired, and your kids are with you asking you to buy them a bunch of snacks that you don't want to buy them because you're going over your food budget again. And then you have to return your fucking shopping cart. Shopping cart theory's model of citizenship understands a responsible member of society as a consumer who appropriately toils in service of the grocery store's profit. Returning your cart is unpaid labor for the store. I just want to clarify that, like, I do think you should return your cart if it's easy for you to do so. You not returning your cart just deflects the labor you'd be doing onto an employee who's underpaid and has a shitty job. The conflict is not between workers and shoppers. Both workers and shoppers are taken advantage of by the grocery store. What you should really do if you want to challenge the system is steal a shopping cart to make a YouTube video with it. That's a joke, I didn't steal this. Look, in an ideal world, I'm all for self-service. I like checking out my own groceries. I don't wanna have to talk to anyone. And more importantly, I don't think most grocery store employees would choose to spend their days pushing carts or bagging groceries if they didn't have to in order to make a living. Ideally, we could get rid of those jobs and also ensure that people's needs are met and also not charge consumers for the value they themselves are creating by checking out their own groceries. Anyway, what was this video supposed to be about? Cart narcs? Agent Sebastian takes free labor for the grocery store to a whole other level. You work here? I work for the Cart Narcs. We're a highly trained organization of special agents. People in the videos often seem to think he works for the stores, which is probably not great for the store's reputations, but he does always present himself as on the store's side. I'm gonna call security right now. On yourself? Whenever someone says they're gonna call security or get a manager, Sebastian's like, oh, so are you gonna tell them you left your cart out then? Sebastian may not be paid by the grocery stores, but I think the work he does for them, whether they want it or not, in some ways parallels the customer monitoring that stores do actually pay for. As shoppers were made responsible for their own shopping, they were increasingly surveilled. And we can see this when we look at the shopping cart. Let's consider the physicality of the shopping cart more closely. A defining feature of the cart is its lattice structure. It has gaps in it. Shopping cart scholars emphasize this transparency of the cart. You can see into it. Nothing is hidden. Everyone knows all the embarrassing things you're buying, you absolute freak. And that's by design. With the introduction of self-service, store owners were increasingly worried about shoplifting, so baskets and carts were made to allow employees to see into them so they could better monitor customers. This is part of a notable reconfiguration of what it is that grocery store employees do. Increasingly, stores now hire employees to have less direct contact with customers and instead spend their time monitoring customer behavior. In the self-checkout area, employees may not actually interact with you most of the time, but they are stationed there to make sure the work of scanning and bagging is going okay and to step in if needed. Like if you're too incompetent to scan your spinach. Sebastian, similarly, monitors your work in the parking lot and intervenes if needed. That's not where the cards go. He films with a GoPro body cam, which is visible but discreet so that people usually don't notice it right away. When people do notice and ask why he has the camera, he says it's for his protection. Are you recording me right well, yeah, it's our, it's our job, but to be safe, so that we can keep ourselves safe. Supposedly, it's collecting evidence in case someone attacks him, or in case someone calls the police and he wants to prove he didn't do anything illegal. That focus on his safety, though, is clearly not the main reason for the camera. The main reason is that he wants to post the videos online, 
Obviously, that's why he's doing this. It's right. not for my safety, it's for your social media business. In one video, a guy gets upset about the fact that he's being filmed, and Sebastian points out that he was already being filmed as he shopped. Sir, there's video, you just walked by 20 video cameras inside that store. They're not gonna use it, they're polite people. So am I. The reference to retail surveillance cameras is not especially convincing in this situation. Those cameras are not there in order to make YouTube videos of you getting pissed off. But I think Sebastian is right that what he's doing is in some ways an extension of widespread surveillance practices that often use the rhetoric of safety or rule enforcement as justification. We're all getting recorded all the time. Oh, well, I have no consent. Apparently the gaps in shopping carts were not enough. So today, stores also have surveillance cameras to monitor for shoplifting. The intention of the cameras is partially to apprehend actual shoplifters and partially to make you aware that you're being watched so that you won't shoplift. But while that was the initial motivation for the cameras, increasingly retailers are now also using them to collect data on customer behavior. What path do you take through the store? How long do you spend at each shelf? Are there any products that you picked up but didn't buy? Some stores are even starting to use facial recognition to identify individual customers. This data can be used to adjust the layout of the store, to make decisions about which products are stocked, to rearrange where products are positioned, all with the goal of influencing your shopping decisions so you'll spend more money. At today's self-service grocery store, you have full autonomy as you shop, but the environment in which you're shopping has been carefully crafted and your behavior is constantly monitored. Cartnarks is an extension of this omnipresent monitoring of public space. The channel is centered around personal responsibility but it sort of rejects the category of personal. You have no privacy. Agent Sebastian could always be watching, and if you're naughty, he'll intervene. If he's feeling extra virtuous, maybe he'll even call the cops. Your personal responsibility requires external maintenance through surveillance and policing. Sebastian often responds to criticisms of Cartnarks by saying that it's okay to get in people's business sometimes. We're a social species. We are a social creature and that's how we learn what to do. People say you're bullying and harassing people. That's simply not true. Is it really so bad to talk to someone in public? Is it really so criminal to touch someone's car? Have we become so antisocial and individualistic that any interaction with our fellow humans can be met with hostility? Look, I'm not against interacting with people in public. Or well, I sort of am personally, but in principle I think it's good. I'm all for strengthening the social fabric of our increasingly atomized grocery stores. You can't do that though if you're not on equal footing. You can't do it through surveillance and policing and a desire to make entertaining, monetizable prank content. You can't do it by channeling the authority of the fictitious Cartnarks organization in a police-style uniform, filming strangers for an audience of hundreds of thousands. If you want to strengthen the social fabric of the grocery store, you need to start by recognizing that it's a hard world in there, and we've got to work together to make the parking lot a better place. There are a lot of new people here because my channel was recently featured as one of Tiffany Ferg's small channel shoutouts. Thank you, welcome, I'm excited to have you here. This video was made possible by my supporters on Patreon, some of whom are listed on screen now. If you like my videos and want to help me continue to make them, you can give as little as a dollar a month to get monthly updates, early access to my videos, uh, I recently posted a little blooper reel, so you can watch that. And I'm now almost at my first Patreon goal of $100 a month, so thank you for that. Also, if you want to watch another video of mine, there will be some on screen somewhere. Maybe check out my F-Boy Island video if you've got an hour to spare. Uh, also, hit the like button. Okay, bye.